Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight to talk about a really important topic, one that is not just important here in Virginia, but is truly important uh, throughout the United States and increasingly uh, throughout the world. Tonight's conversation is about how a movement and a community and an industry can look at the su successes they have had and realize that they can and they must do better than they have. I'm now pleased to introduce what will be a much more entertaining panel uh, than I am. I'm gonna introduce our panelists individually and they'll take their seats and then we'll begin our discussion. First is Jane West. Trust me, she's back there. There you go. Jane is the CEO of Jane West, a cannabis lifestyle brand, and also the founder of Women Grow, an important organization uh, within the movement and within the industry. She's also been called the Martha Stewart of cannabis before Martha Stewart was the Martha Stewart of cannabis. <laughs> Next, uh, Steve Hawkins. Steve is the executive director of the Marijuana Policy Project, and he pr previously uh, served in leadership roles at the NAACP and the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. Uh, next, Hope Weissman. Hope is the founder of the dispensary Marion, Maine in Maryland, and in 2017, she became the youngest African-American dispensary owner in the United States. Yeah. And last but not least, Jen Michelle Padini. Jen Michelle is the executive director of Virginia's chapter of Normal and the development director for the national chap the national office of Normal. I guess. Um, sorry about that. Uh, she's also the foremost expert on cannabis policy in the Commonwealth. And if anyone says anything different, they got to take it up with me afterwards. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna have a little bit of a fanboy moment because this is a really cool panel with people I've worked with before and some people I haven't, uh, so you'll bear with me. But what I'd like to do is start with the big picture and work our way down and eventually finish with some questions talking about the Commonwealth uh, specifically. Uh, but first for Jane and Hope, for cannabis entrepreneurs, uh, what do you see as the biggest challenges facing uh, your businesses and you as business owners right now? I'll let you start since you're running a cannabis business right now. <laughs> yeah, so um, for me, I'm on the plant touching side of the business, which presents so many obstac obstacles to any entrepreneur. Um, I'd say the biggest uh, challenge for to be in the industry on a plant touching and a non-plant touching side would be um, just access to information, to be honest. You know, if, if you're doing a quick Google search, it's very difficult to even figure out where to begin. Um, so I know for me, the best way that I got around that was just connecting with other people who knew what they were doing. Um, I started out by going to a lot of conferences, much like this, uh, networking with people who were already in the industry um, or aspiring to be, but just had more knowledge than me, and that's how I got around that barrier. Yeah, I second that because it is, there is so much popularity in this space right now and in just starting startups in general, like the word entrepreneur is being used so much more for people to describe what they're doing. And there's a lot of businesses now just making money out of that desire, whether it's an event or a job fair where like, you, it, there's almost, it's almost predatory practices of people trying to get you into the funnel because there's so much demand to get into the industry. But once you do get over that hurdle and you do start your business, yeah. the, the, at the end of the day, capital is king and having access to it is crucial. And so uh, that's, that's the biggest challenge across the board. You need not only money to 
build a grow facility where you're making a cash crop and you want to produce the highest yields possible. But then in many um, different regulated states where businesses are vertically integrated, you're not just growing that flower, you now need to package it, brand it, explain to the customer what it is, have bud tenders selling it to them, have retail stores that are open. And that's a lot to take on mm -hmm. for a new starter business. So I think it's great that uh, our two business owners up here are women. Um, uh, The reality is business owners, by and large, in the cannabis industry uh, do not look like Jane and Hope. They look a hell of a lot more like me, white and male. Um, and so my next question, a follow-up for both of you, uh, what are the unique challenges that you face as entrepreneur, entrepreneurs uh, as women and people of color in the intersection of both that might be unique to this industry and might be true of entrepreneurship generally in the United States? Well, for me, I mean, I want to add on there that I'm, I'm, I'll be 27 in two weeks. Um, so walking into a room uh, full of my peers that are all in their late 50s, 60s, white, male, is very intimidating for me. Um, I come from a background in finance, um, Wall Street, so it's not foreign, um, but it's always been intimidating. Um, I think the biggest challenge for women of color in this industry um, are, are just to be taken seriously, um, especially when it comes to capital. Uh, if you look at where VC capital is going, it's not going to women and it's definitely not going to black women. And that's because most of the time venture capitalists don't look like me and people love to invest in other people that look like them, that remind them of themselves. Um, so it's difficult, but for me, I look at it as you know, I love challenges, which is why I think I'm where I'm at right now. I looked at this industry, I saw uh, where it was going, and I said, you know what, I'm capable of doing that. And that's what I do in all of my meetings where I am the only one that looks like me. I know that I have to go a little bit above and beyond to prove that I'm capable and that I'm knowledgeable. But uh, I, I feel as though as long as you come in with that, uh, with that confidence and you actually have the knowledge to back it up, uh, people accept you and I mean I've been fully embraced in this industry um, I, I think I am kind of unique in that but I use this platform to to blaze a trail behind me so that you know you can no longer say I'm the youngest African-American hopefully there's 50 other right right behind me so I congratulations also I second that and, and at the end of the day it is the access to capital and no matter what startup you're creating in what industry as a woman or person of color we, it's far less than three percent of venture capital that goes to those groups so when you add in the high risk factor of starting a business within the cannabis space it's even more important that you're turning to your trusted networks to get that capital and that people trust in your ability to do that. And those networks are dominated by Caucasian men. And so like, you're going to have to, if you want access to vast amounts of traditional capital, which is what you're going to need to succeed, those are the networks you have to tap into. And at the end of the day, it's just systemic. You, People pick up the people, oh, it wasn't that hard. I picked up the phone. I called my friend I did this deal with back at Bear Stearns and did it. And none of those people. Yeah, reflect. I, I have people tell me that they have venture capital meetings and someone wrote them a check in the meeting. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, I have to like crawl, beg, and cry for it. But, um, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's really just, it's another thing I'd like to point out is just those connections to even know where to go to get this cannabis, uh, cannabis, I'm sorry, to get the capital. Um, <laughs> so They've to even cash. know where to go. Um, and then, you know, we're seeing the industry grow rapidly, right? So there's a lot of M&A play where you don't even have these relationships with these companies to be in included in that. So I think that's the biggest challenge. And, you know, events like this are awesome because they really bring together entrepreneurs that wouldn't normally have access to each other. Um, because I look at it that, you know, larger players should be focused more on diversity as well and um, ownership with diverse, diverse people. So, you know, they need us just as much as we need them. So, uh, Jen, Michelle, and Steve, a, a similar question for both of you. You're advocates, you uh, 
uh, run and work with uh, MPP and Normal, two of the largest organizations in the world working on cannabis reform. Uh, there are a lot of people who think cannabis reform is easy, that it's a done deal. Like I said in my opening remarks, you look at public opinion and you say, well, that's it, it's game over. The reality is actually much different. Um, can you talk about what the uh, biggest challenges are working in the trenches, working on legislation, working on ballot initiatives that, that you both have found? Well, uh, clearly, we are not in a, a position where it's, it, it's a done deal, right? I mean, public opinion can switch. Um, right now, as you were point, pointing out, we're, we're at 68%, but that can change. And right now, I, I think one of our great challenges is that while there is the political wind uh, to our back with five states right now actively looking to legalize in, in this session and another five states beyond that, um, uh, there is not the resources flowing in to actually push the legislation. And it's, it's this strange paradox right now where I think businesses that are doing well in the space um, are, you know, they're interested in growing and, and not having a longer term vision. So, you know, if we want to see the end of federal prohibition, in my view, we have to get to the point where we have 25 states uh, across the country that have legalized. I think there's a map to, to get there over the next three years. It's not impossible, but it's gonna require concerted effort and resources. And the biggest challenge in this space now is driving that for, forward to, to, uh, to, to get to that point. Yeah, I would certainly agree with Steve that there is money to be made in the cannabis space, but the pathway to that money in states that have yet to legalize, in particular, the, the regulated adult use of, of marijuana is not paved by the dollars of those corporations. It is paved by the blood, sweat, and tears of advocates looking simply to reform their state laws. So that is certainly one uphill battle, is the lack of funding for the political process that, that really does create this pathway to legalization. On a more grassroots level, which of course is what normal is, a grassroots organization, I, I think one of the biggest uh, obstacles or hurdles, and not for lack of desire, but is a lack of understanding of what the legislative process is and what the realities of those landscapes are. We are seeing uh, right now in, in the heat of legislative sessions across the country, uh, states that are proposing legalization initiatives and, and then turning them down because they aren't perfect and they aren't getting everything that they want in all in one fell swoop. And anyone in this room from Virginia knows that, that that's not a luxury that, that anyone in this space really can afford. You have to be able as advocates, as policy folks to come to the table and say, we'd like this, but, but we're all gonna agree that this is good enough for this year and we'll come back next year and do better. So uh, Steve, a follow up for you that is really big picture. So the Attorney General uh, in a hearing before Congress today uh, talked quite a bit relative for an attorney general about cannabis policy. Uh, can you talk a little bit for those of us in the room who uh, did it right and stayed away from cable news all day and didn't listen to it? Um, and in terms of what he talked about uh, and where this administration currently is and where you think it's headed. Well, I wouldn't think I would be cheering Attorney General Barr tonight, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, so his position is, is this, um, he sees the the uh, disharmony between federal and state law, that there are 10 states in the country that have legalized cannabis. And while his personal opinion is that marijuana should be illegal, um, he realizes that that disharmony uh, uh, is, is going to uh, wreak havoc in the courts and in the economy. And so uh, right now what's pending in Congress is the States Act, which would allow those businesses that are operating in states that have legalized cannabis to not worry about the federal government coming after them. Cannabis is still a Schedule I drug under the Controlled Substance Act, which means it is on the same level with heroin. 
meaning it has no medicinal value. And, you know, it's been there since 1972, I guess, with, uh, with uh, Nixon. So, uh, so DOJ is taking a look at the States Act, which is promising. Um, if they get behind it, which would certainly be different than, you know, when, when Jeff Sessions wa was there, um, you know, it, it has a chance to, to, to pass in our Congress. And, and that will be, I think, a stepping stone towards federal uh, prohibition ending. Jane, a quick follow-up on that. As uh, a business owner who works in both medical and adult use states, how real within those states is the fear of the federal government coming in and, and cracking down? I mean, the fear is real in terms of um, how much those businesses can build. So, like, right now what we're seeing is a consolidation in the market of bigger players that have more access to capital who are now being called multi-state operators. Um, it's going to be a long time, uh, which hopefully it's not, because that's how business is really going to build, but for interstate commerce to be occurring. Um, and so for right now, if, you have an, if you're able to start businesses in multiple states and have those businesses grow and become a multi-state operator, that's how you're going to be able to really build brands and build businesses and build those companies. And so I see a lot of groups like that, like, that are they're not fearful at all. They're going all in and doubling down on all of their bets. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is what we're not seeing. Um, everyone wants to put forward a strong face about their success of their business. They're looking for more investors. They're looking to grow. They want their brand name well known. But really, underneath the surface, access to banking, access to merchant services, being able to take a credit card from someone at your store and swipe it, these are that's what they're really truly fearful of. Not that the federal government's gonna come in with the SWAT team, but more importantly, that all of their bank accounts are gonna get shut down and frozen, that they're going to lose access to the very, the, the way that they're getting money into their company. And this happens even in Colorado, five years in, on a weekly basis, that people's entire bank accounts and merchant services are shut down and they can only accept cash. So a question for anyone on the panel who wants to tackle it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the different approaches to cannabis reform and the way that cannabis reform ends up playing out in terms of the industry and how those approaches have been successful or not at reinvesting in uh, communities that have been hit hardest by the war on drugs? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take the first crack at it. I, the, the, the business now has has grown substantially, right? I mean, three years ago, there was probably only one company that had like a director of government relations. Now, several of the big multi-state operators, you know, are growing in sophistication, a lot more lobbying happen happening in state capitals and, and, in, and in Congress. Um, resources flowing in to acquire licenses across states, a um, lot of venture capital as, as pointed out. Um, and in the mix of all that though, is the inherent question of what is due those communities that were devastated by the war on drugs, victimized by the war on drugs, people whose lives were destroyed in the uh, process. Um, when you think about it, we still have 650,000 arrests in the United States for possession every year. Uh, yeah, a few hundred thousand of those people will do jail time. Uh, 10 days in jail can wreck any of our lives, right? You lose your job and all, and all other collateral consequences. And that's not even counting the millions of people who have uh, records from, from over these last four, 40 years of the drug war. The challenge that faces, I think, the, the industry and policymakers is what equity looks like in this space. It's, it's licenses, to be sure. Um, there's also, though, just how do you create job pipelines? Um, I have gone into larger companies, and there's a, a floor of workers, right? You know, 100 young people in, you know, are, you know, in, in the room not one person of color, right? So this is an industry and in its nascency still needs not only 
you know, their, their uh, chief governmental affairs per person, but they all have to begin to think about a chief diversity officer, what diversity looks like, how to, how to bring people into to the job pipeline. And then lastly, the millions of dollars that will be raised through taxes um, uh, and, and, and licenses, how that money gets distributed back, right? Does it go into a state general fund and never, you know, and sort of, sort of be absorbed there? Or is there a, a duty owed to those communities that were devastated by the war on drugs to at least put some of that money back into those communities for job training, for reentry, for education? Uh, and that's the challenge. Um, I think it's important to note, too, that a lot of companies, when they're in their infancy, it's very difficult to do that. Um, so we have a lot of people, my dispensary is located in an opportunity zone in Maryland. Um, a lot of people come in and they say, what are you guys doing to give back? Or we'll get uh, sponsorship requests. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, I mean, we just opened. Uh, my family, we pretty much spent our, everybody's life savings uh, opening this store. We are fighting to keep the lights on every day, you know? So we're not at that point yet. Some of the larger companies are, and they, they I, we were talking about this earlier, they're doing it for show because it's a hot topic right now. It's a, it's a, it's a sexy point of the inter industry right now, a diversity, a social equity. What are you doing to give back to the community? I think there needs to be a, a focus put on uh, equity ownership within the, the cannabis community because you're not seeing that a lot of that. However, there's an issue with getting that into the bills um, and making it part of the law. So a lot of people are, I mean, it's, it's something that we're fighting to balance right now. And I think that, that uh, we have to figure out what's the right level of equity ownership. What's the right level of give back in your community? What is, what is fair? Um, I don't know if we'll ever reach true fairness in the industry. Um, and I think people like myself, Jane, everything that you both do to, to make this happen, that, that's what's gonna further um, more diversity in the industry from every side of it. Yeah. Speaking of what we do, <laughs> and, and I would like to offer a brief uh, commentary on what Virginia, how Virginia is failing in epic proportions uh, in regard to not just equity, but access to the industry and to the regulated cannabis model that we have implemented in this state. We have codified in our state law that there can be access limited to business ownership, to employment, and to patient access for those with even a misdemeanor marijuana possession charge. And this is not because, you know, I would advocate for, for this policy measure to be included, but because certain stakeholders come to the table and demand this and we have to, you know, simply coalesce and move on. But that is something you can certainly be aware of in your state or, or in this state and, and that these are the obstacles that even, you know, in these more conservative states we are facing. Um, we are miles away from discussing equity in Virginia. What we are fighting right now is, is not denying people access to even participate as a patient. Yeah, and we need to talk more about expungement programs and have that be part of the very initial conversation that we're doing because it's crazy that we're talking about taxes and that's not even being discussed yet. Um, additionally, there are states that started out with laws that if you have a crime, a misdemeanor or a felony related to a drug charge, you can't work in the industry, which that alone is just, I can't even. And, uh, and I also second um, what Hope said about some of the larger companies now just giving it lip service. Like, well, we've started an initiative, a diversity initiative here. And so like, oh, well, tell me more about that initiative. Because right. if you'd like, you can just make sure that the next person you hire doesn't look like anyone else around here. And that's how you affect immediate change. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we need more of just immediate action because of the pace of which the industry is growing. If you don't make changes right now within one year when your company is 10x, it's going to be that same team, that same generic demographic. So, Steve, a quick follow-up there. Um, uh, Hope described this lip service being paid to diversity within businesses. 
And uh, looking around, I think that's also happening politically too. There are states, there are uh, cities that are engaging this issue very well and in a very head-on way and meaningfully so. And there are other places that are you know, putting up a lot of window dressing around this. Uh, what have you found to be some of the better efforts towards uh, diversity, inclusion, um, whether it's expungement or other programs to help get people in uh, who have come from communities that have been hurt by the war on drugs either into ownership positions, having just the ability to be a bud tender in some cases or some mix of the two? Yeah, I mean, and I think the reality is that there are no really good programs at the moment. Um, you know, California has its equity efforts, um, which have, you know, positive, you know, positive sides and, and then some, some negative. Um, I'm hopeful that what Connecticut is bringing forth could potentially be a model. Uh, the states right now, New York and Connecticut, Illinois, uh, as it's moving towards legalization, will have a pretty strong e equity provision. Uh, Rhode Island, probably less so. Um, uh, but the, the, the five states right now, you know, f at least four of them will have strong equity provisions. I mean, this is an issue with New York and New Jersey right now, um, where where the, you know, the minority caucus, black and Latino caucus is not going to stand for, um, for a watered down equity provision. Um, now there are the issues of, you know, not letting the, the perfect be the enemy of the good, but, but they're gonna have to give more. So I'm taken by the fact that in New York, in response to the uh, companies that have these vertical licenses that cost you know, twenty million dollars to get going in, in, in the state. Um, they found twenty-five million dollars to offer as a uh, as a sort of an investment pot for minority businesses. My suspicion is if they can find twenty-five million, they can find another <laughs> twenty-five million. But here's the thing that that I think is missing in the equity space, and that is how do we move this from just a business discussion to a social impact discussion. So you have foundations around the country that are talking about social impact investing, using their corpus and investing it in, um, in, um, in um, ways that, that, for, that are further our society. Why not, like foundations in New York, create a $200 million social impact pot that benefits minority and business entrepreneurs and, and can get paid back over time. There's a real need for, for that, and no one has yet stepped up to the plate, um, but that's part of how I think we can begin to address some of the equity needs. Uh, thanks, Steve. We're gonna certainly be kind to our hosts and turn some questions toward the Commonwealth of Virginia as well. Uh, so Jen, Michelle, can you give us a status of reform in Virginia right now, what the program as it is looks like uh, and what's been happening in the legislative session this year? Sure. So in um, 1979, Virginia passed one of the nation's very first medical marijuana laws, oddly enough. Uh, unfortunately, it used the word prescription, so it's been self-defeating ever since day one. And literally nothing happened between 79 and 2015. 2015, we saw some fresh faces to the marijuana policy conversation, not only in Virginia, but around the country, and, and we sort of saw the proliferation of um, either allowances for people with epilepsy or allowances for CBD. And Virginia passed in 2015 what's called an affirmative defense for possession, and it was limited only to intractable epilepsy patients uh, and their parents or caregivers. We came back in 2016 and 2017 and implemented a regulatory model to um, produce medical cannabis products in the state of Virginia because uh, committing federal interstate drug trafficking was not never gonna be the end solution for these patients. We passed that in 2017. In 2018, we really moved the needle and we didn't hang extra conditions on the Christmas tree of approved disorders. Instead, we passed a policy called Let Doctors Decide 
and removed the conditions list. So now physicians can simply practice medicine and make recommendations for their patients instead of you know, consulting your state senator to see which antibiotic might be appropriate for your cold. We <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, this year, we came back and cleaned up some of the language that was oddly written. Um, you may have heard this program referred to as CBD slash THCA oil, and you may have misconstrued that as a CBD or low THC model. In fact, it's not. It is an extraction-based medical cannabis program like many other states that have come before us. You will be able to get medical cannabis formulations in a variety of preparations, gels, creams, tinctures, lozenges, lollipops, suppositories, patches, I'm running out of breath. Uh, anything that you can typically get at a pharmacy, you can get from one of our pharmaceutical processors. They have nothing to do with pharmaceuticals. They're actually pharmacies uh, that are the storefronts of medical cannabis companies. And each dose, meaning each single unit, one capsule, one spray, one dropper full, can have up to 10 milligrams of THC. You may note that's the same amount that's uh, allowed in one edible serving in Colorado. Uh, no one in here would qualify that as low THC, so presumably we shouldn't be qualifying Virginia's program as that either. There is no limitation on, your pa on a patient's dosage. So little Maddie in Hampton Roads who needs 200 milligrams of THC per day to fight her tumors will be now be able to get that amount of medicine at our facilities instead of her parents having to commit federal interstate drug trafficking and getting untested products. Um, our facilities have been licensed. They are under construction and there are five of them to start around the state. They are all vertically integrated, meaning everything from uh, cultivation through extraction, formulation, processing, and delivery happens from one location. And they'll begin opening in the second half of this year. The million dollar question is what is that date? I don't know, but I think September is probably the likely month that we'll see the first facility open. On the criminal justice side, nothing's happening. And nothing's happening because Virginians continue to reelect the same people to represent them in the General Assembly. I can only do with what you give me. Uh, <laughs> uh, sure, that's gonna help a little bit this year too. <laughs> Um, we have the good fortune of having an election every year in Virginia, so if you don't like who's representing you right now, hint you shouldn't, then you can vote differently. <laughs> when there is a draft, drastic shift in our legislature, that is when you will see more meaningful reform. Uh, that is when you will see our limited vertical model shift to a tiered licensing model analogous to those in other states that uh, operates not under the Board of Pharmacy but under a marijuana regulatory agency. That is when you will see uh, expungement finally get out of committee. That is when you will see hopefully not only the half measure of decriminalization pass but a regulated adult use model succeed as well. So you talked a little bit about this in your endorsement of the entire slate of Virginia General Assembly candidates and your glowing recommendation of the body. Um, but uh, you know, you look around the country and you see states with what are considered more traditional full-fledged medical cannabis systems. Uh, and they look, a lot of them, a lot more conservative than Virginia. Um, in some cases, you can explain that away by saying, well, those are states with a lot of libertarians and so that would make sense. But then you look at a state like Ohio that's more conservative than Virginia, and they have a bigger, more robust medical cannabis program uh, than here. Uh, what are some of those unique challenges that are standing between uh, Virginia as it is now and Virginia having a medical program like in Ohio or like in Connecticut or like in Pennsylvania? Uh, so states not only with more traditional and robust medical cannabis programs, though also that often come with conditions lists. Um, not only those states, but also states that have regulated the adult use of marijuana. The majority of those states have a ballot initiative process, and we don't have a ballot initiative process. I have to disappoint folks every week who call and say, well, why can't we just get it on the ballot? because we don't have that ability here. Uh, legislation can only be introduced by a senator or a delegate, and then it has to be 
moved through a committee before it ever gets voted on by the floor uh, of the Senate or the House. So I would say that that's the, the primary challenge, uh, not just who is in the legislature hearing these bills, but that Virginians lack that ability to move public policy forward with their own, um, their own votes on issues. Thanks, so I'll ask one more question. This is gonna be one for everyone on the panel and then we'll uh, turn Q&A over to the audience. So uh, get your questions ready. Uh, this is one that I tried to put into words before and it was just word vomit the entire time. So bear with me while I read this. Um, what do you guys think is the most dangerous piece of misinformation out there about cannabis? Or similarly related, what piece of accurate information do you wish everyone in America could know about cannabis? Um, I'll start just from being in Colorado where we've had rec adult use recreational cannabis where you just go in and show your ID and can access the products on the market for five years now. And we've been collecting data on substance use within the household through the NIH, through the, the federal government. And one of the um, biggest fears of prohibitionists has always been teen use and what will happen once everyone legalizes. And now we know that actually teen use in Colorado is down. And what's even more important is that the overall use of illi all illicit drugs is down among teens in the state of Colorado because black market drug dealers, ca can uh, cannabis sales were their, num their main sale to high schoolers, to minors, and that all those extra illicit drugs, those were just add-ons. That was just, oh, this other stuff I have on me. Well, without that market there to exist, those types of sales aren't simply aren't occurring and that market really is drying up. And so some of the biggest fear, also we know our roads is, are just as safe as they were prior to legalization. And so some of these really important data points that were just big question marks, like we don't know what will happen. Well, we do know now and we do have data now. And so some of those biggest fears um, are being resolved. And then when you start to look at the opioid crisis in the United States and how states that have legalization have lower death rates. I mean, there's, this is a public health policy issue. Um, and, the best way that, and the best way we can do that is collecting that data, so. So I would say that, that one, of the, one of the dangers out there is, is still the public misperception. Um, and, and, you know, and I think Hollywood uh, perpetuates it, right? of who is a cannabis user, right? You know, the, every Hollywood movie, whether it's, you know, Cheech and Chong or Pineapple Express, you know, or any of my other favorites, it, <laughs> it, it you know, it, it gives one image, right? But no one talks about the Wall Street banker who tonight, right, after doing $10 billion in business, is using his or her vape pen, right? And they may use they may drink scotch on the weekend, right? But they want to wake up tomorrow not with a scotch hangover, so they're turning to their vape pen. The stories of who is a cannabis user is not told. And until we can change that narrative, we're going to get stuck in different states. Um, and it's important to change that narrative. So I'm going to jump in quickly, uh, Steve. This, this reminds me of one of my favorite uh, anecdotes. It's a, a personal experience. I was in a dispensary in a legal state, and I was talking to the dispensary owner. Just, what is your clientele like? Um, you know, you're in a part of town that is a mixture of uh, a lot of professional development, but also a lot of low-income housing. And I was just curious, what does your, your clientele look like? And he said, you know. It's what you would expect looking around. There are people who would come off as the traditional movie style stoner, he said, and people in a suit and tie, he said, and we get a lot of Jackie O's. And I said, you get a lot of Jackie O's? And he said, yeah, they're these older women. Uh, women over 50 are the fastest growing cannabis using demographic in the United States. <laughs> He said, and there's a lot of Jackie O's. And I, I said, 
you've got to describe to me what this is. And he said, they're these older women and they come in and they have these big sunglasses on and their head is wrapped in a scarf. He said, and they come in and they're very discreet and they don't want anyone to see them. They probably live like 40 miles from this dispensary. <laughs> um, and I said, okay, that's right. Honestly, within five minutes, in comes this woman, big sunglasses, head wrapped in um, like a floral scarf, and the guy who's checking ID says, ma'am, I need you to take your sunglasses off so I can verify the ID. And she goes, whoo, whoo, really quick. <laughs> and in she goes and knew exactly what she wanted and out, it was the most efficient cannabis transaction in the history of the United <laughs> States. But he got a lot of Jackie O's and it's the opposite of what you would, would expect. But as business owners, you, you know, this is- Yeah, this I, is I get a lot of baby boomers, which surprised me when we first opened, but I, a lot, probably a 30% of my client base. Well, if you look at it as, if you add antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications, women in the demographic of 35 to 50 take more mind-altering drugs on a daily basis than any other group of Americans. <laughs> and that is what cannabis is, and many of them are turning to that versus the pills that they're on. So sorry I interrupted the yeah. flow, Hope. Go. No um, so for me, the question I get asked the most is, how do I start my own dispensary? Or I want to do the same thing you've done. Um, and I, I, I think that is probably one of the biggest misconceptions of the industry, that it's easy or even that you can. Um, <laughs> you know, and I know that sounds odd coming from me, um, someone who was able to do it, but I got in at the right time. I had the right support behind me. Um, I had access to the capital I needed and the resources I needed, and I built a team um, that supported me in every other area that I didn't have. Um, but now the industry has grown so quickly, and it's now so large that it's very difficult to even enter, um, especially in states that already have established a program. Um, your best bet is to, to try and get in on states that are now developing programs, but even then it becomes very difficult. So I think, um, and then on top of it, once you are operating in the industry, a lot of people think that means you're an instant millionaire. Um, you know, you can go hang out in, uh, <laughs> in on the, the, the coast of Italy, you know, no. Um, it's, it's a very, very difficult uh, industry to operate in. Every day we're having to um, monitor what's going on from a legislative perspective and then be ready to shift your business model uh, to fit what, what is going to happen. You have to be able to anticipate what's happening with these larger multi-state operators and stay competitive with them. Um, and then on top of that, you have to be able to, to communicate and educate your consumer who doesn't understand any of that um, and who they don't understand why an eighth is $60 in the dispensary and is $35 on, on the street and why you're charging so much. They look at you and there's this big movement in Maryland right now, uh, patience over profit. And I think to myself, but without profit, there will be no program, there'll be no dispensary for you to come to without profit. That's how we keep our doors open, that's how we operate. So I think there just, there needs to be more education on the medicinal properties of cannabis, but just about how the business works so that uh, patients can really understand what, what it is we're doing, how hard we work to be able to provide the quality medicine that people really need access to um, so that this program could be more appreciated. Um, the programs all across the nation could be more appreciated rather than criticized so, um, so deeply. I, I feel like that's all I hear is about what is wrong. Patients coming into my store talking about what's wrong on the state level and then what's wrong with my store and how I should fix it. And I think to myself, there's so many different moving pieces of this industry that make it more sophisticated and unique than even um, some of our most regulated industries today. So all of that needs to come to the forefront a little bit more. Jen Michelle. Okay, so I'm gonna bring it back to Virginia. Um, I would say that the, the, the thing I would most want to emphasize um, is the way that we talk about the public policy of legalizing marijuana in Virginia. Um, the most important conversation we can have about this as Virginians with our families, with our policymakers, 
is not about personal freedom, is not about it's just a plant. The most important frame we can set for this conversation is that when Virginia as a state legalizes and regulates marijuana, it provides us the opportunity to take it off the street corner and put it behind an age verified counter where it can be regulated for safe adult access. Because the primary rebuttal to any legalization conversation at a policy, in a policy situation in Virginia is, oh, what about the children? Well, tell me how we are protecting the children. And unfortunately, as Jane illustrated, we don't have to guess any longer what happens when a state regulates marijuana. We can look at the abundant amounts of data coming out of states that already have. We know that youth use uh, goes down or even remains um, level in some of the higher age brackets. We don't, it is not, woe the children. But drug dealers don't ID, drug dealers don't label, drug dealers don't lab test their products. And we can also look to other substances. Um, when you go to pick up your antibiotics at CVS, the pharmacy technician is not going to offer you heroin. When you go buy um, alcohol at the VABC, our state-run liquor store, that clerk is not likely to also steal your wallet. Um, when you go buy cigarettes at the gas station, please stop smoking, uh, that person is um, highly unlikely to sexually assault you. And these are all adult use substances that are regulated for safe access. And, and marijuana is not special. We can apply the same public policy measures to that. So in Virginia and even in other conservative states, when we're talking about marijuana and the need to change our failed policy of prohibition is because we need to regulate it to provide safe access to implement consumer and public safety standards and to um, provide that answer to what about the children. Well, everyone, I'd like you to help me thank our panelists for a great discussion. <laughs>